The whole purpose of the Christian message is to confront the sinner's sin so you can call the sinner to repentance and forgiveness. The sinner doesn't like that. We had a question on the, on the little questionnaire that you people sent me. It mm -hmm. said, do you feel like might be offending Democrats with some of the things you say? And my response to that is, look, my goal is to offend everyone. <laughs> that is my initial goal, to tell you that you are without God in the world, that there's only one Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, that you're in sin, that sin brings death and punishment. But the good news is Jesus Christ is the Savior who has provided a way for you to be forgiven by bearing your sins in his body on the tree so that God's justice is satisfied and his love can be extended to you by putting your trust in Christ. I offend people all the time because that's necessary. If you try to develop a kind of Christianity that's inoffensive, it's not Christianity. It's not the gospel. You want to honor God, you want to be faithful to the gospel, but you don't want to be foolish. You want to be responsible. You, you want to take the long view and not the short view. Uh, you have a responsibility to provide for your family. If you don't do that, you're worse than an infidel. You also have a responsibility, and this is explicit, both in Colossians and Ephesians, that you submit yourself to your master, whoever your boss is, whoever is over you. You don't overturn that submission. You don't run roughshod over that submission uh, in, in some ill-conceived uh, effort to fulfill the Great Commission. And I would just encourage encourage you to make those kinds of opportunities um, sort of dependent on the Lord opening a door for you on a personal level. I think it's irresponsible for you to overthrow your other Christian responsibilities and duties as somebody who's employed by someone, gainfully employed, taking their money and their resources with the expectation that you're going to perform according to the, you know, whatever the standard of that uh, organization is, and reserve the opportunity to communicate the gospel for those times when it's right and that the door is sensibly opened. And again, you, you should be helped along with this by realizing that the Lord will draw his own to him and he will find someone to communicate the gospel to them. You just want to be the one ready and eager when that door is opened in a responsible and gracious way to exercise that privilege. We are stewards of divine revelation. We can't pick and choose. We can't mingle it with our own ideas or with psychology or philosophy. God has deposited his truth in our hands to manage for the benefit of his house. Colossians 1.25 calls us both deacons and stewards. We serve humbly, dispensing what is not our own. What we teach is not our own. Therein lies the discipline of study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman needing not to be ashamed because you rightly divide the word of truth. The Bible is the unfolding of the mysteries of God. And the faithful steward who is accountable to God will diligently attend himself to the word that he can divide it rightly. We read in 1 Corinthians 1 that by wisdom the world cannot know God. It's not accessible to them. He said that back in chapter 2, 1 Corinthians 2, 14, A natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. So how is the world going to ever hear the truth about God if they can't access it themselves? The Lord has answered that with the call to ministry of servants of His who are stewarding His divine mysteries, meaning the revelation of God contained in Scripture. That's our function. We are stewards of divine revelation. You wonder why carefully and thoughtfully and consistently we exposit the Scripture verse by verse by verse, because that is the only way that we can discharge our responsibility to be stewards of the mysteries of God. I think anyone who uh, uh, says he is getting revelation from God poses a massive threat to the integrity of Scripture, to the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Revelation 22, 18 and 19, if you add anything to these words, shall be added to you the plagues that are written in it. This whole issue of, uh, of continuing revelation, which marks the charismatic movement, uh, has, has created a haven for every imaginable aberration. Once you get outside the pages of Scripture, and you start saying you have divine revelation, then the question comes, is it equal to Scripture? And if you tell me it's not equal to Scripture, then you've told me that God doesn't always tell the truth. 
What, what do you mean? If, if God is revealing himself, then this is God revealing himself and he speaks the truth. Uh, and then how would you prove that this was God? And how would you prove that it was the truth? The record just will not sustain that. Uh, furthermore, if God were going to give continuing revelation, it would seem to me that he would give it to the people who were most trustworthy and who had the soundest theology, not to the people who were least trustworthy, making money off of it and had the worst theology. Why would God be talking to those people? Plato is once attributed to have said this, no one is more hated than one who speaks the truth. So in a, in a post-truth world, no one is more hated than those who speak the truth. Jesus said he came to testify to the truth. That's still our mandate, right? Doesn't matter what the culture is demanding from us. I remember when I was doing the Ben Shapiro show, did anybody see that, did that interview with Ben? Uh, he said, does it bother you that people are offended by what you say? And my response was, no, I, I, I live to offend people. That's the reason I'm there, is to offend people who are living in lies and deception, headed to hell, and uh, don't know the truth. The gospel will always be an offense. First Corinthians 1, it is, a, it is foolishness to the Gentiles, and it is a stumbling block to the Jews. The gospel always offends the contented sinner living in deception. How do you know when someone's a believer? It is obvious. With heart, soul, mind, and strength, they love the Lord. They willingly, lovingly obey His law. They fear Him in the sense of worship. This is what salvation does. It is a massive transformation. The dividing line between sinners and saints, sons of God and sons of the devil, the righteous and the unrighteous, is expressed in learning Christ, hearing Him, being taught in Him the truth that is in Jesus. All those words are referring to the gospel. That is why it is so important, listen carefully, for you to know that the ability to live the Christian life is not related to somebody giving you a pep talk. It is directly related to what you think about God and what you think about yourself. And if you have a superficial view of God and an elevated view of yourself, you're set up to worship yourself and not God. That is what's wrong with all man-centered preaching. It does no help, provides no strength against sin, because your strength against sin does not come from feeling good about yourself. It comes from feeling terrible about yourself. It comes from a broken and contrite heart, as we saw in Psalm 51. Isaiah 66, God says, Who am I seeking? Whoever has a broken and a contrite heart and trembles at my word. No one can give you anything more powerful than a deep and wide, high understanding of God. I think fear is just another word for worship, adoration. Um, it's hard to put that in a lightning round, Nathan, because fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That, that's where everything starts, is having a reverence of God. And as R.C. would say, the, the greatest need of any human being, believer or unbeliever, is to know God. And until you know the fullness of God, you don't know what it means to fully fear God. The ability to fear God is directly correlated to how much you know about Him. The more you have imbibed the, the wisdom and revelation of God's character on the pages of Holy Scripture, the more glorious He becomes to you, the more you see His beauty, the more you will have awe and fear and worship Him. We are designated saints because we literally, in God's eyes, are covered with His righteousness. We are set apart. We are holy in our position before God. In our practice, we still struggle with sin. So you can say about the church of Jesus Christ, they are saints. But you have to immediately then say, we are also imperfect. Sinner is a term used in the New Testament of non-believers. We are saints. But we are saints that are not yet perfect until we're with the Lord in glory. A fool is the person who rejects God, His gospel, and His word. Fools die, says Proverbs 10. 
for lack of a heart of wisdom. I don't care what you know. I don't care how many degrees you have. You may profess to be wise, but apart from God and the knowledge of God and the fear of God and the knowledge of Christ and the gospel and salvation, you are a fool. And you are a fool willingly by choice because you choose your sin. Proverbs 9.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's where wisdom begins. If you don't fear the Lord, you have no wisdom. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. You want to stop being a fool? Listen to God. You want to stop being a fool? Turn to His revelation in His holy Word. John says in 1 John, how do you know someone's a believer? By their love. And John even says, if you see a man in need and you don't meet his need, how does the love of God dwell in you? So for everyone, it is a command to love God and love others. For believers, it is an expression of their new life. We love because we have been begotten of God. We love because we are in God and God is love. That's why our Lord says they'll know you by your love. So for us, it isn't just a, a, a command that if, like for, for everybody else is impossible to fulfill. For us, it is a command which we eagerly and joyfully desire to fulfill. We love because He first loved us. We love because He dwells in us. We love because the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control.